this is the first full session um, I've had, uh, sorry, the second full session I've had since uh, my dogs are all gone now. And uh, as I said, one of them, uh, a woman in um, Taos brought her pooch, and now we have Sage here. So I'm just so pleased to, uh, to have animal energy. She was an extraordinary dog, this little Sophie. Um, she walked in, sort of, she's a little, little dog about this size with kind of short legs, and she walked in, looked around and taking possession of her space, and then she walked over and started very gently digging a little hole, not really a hole, but kind of moving aside the ground, uh, just in that altar area. And then having smelled whatever she, you know, felt that she smelled or whatever ritual she was doing, she then took her nose and scratched the gravel back into place in the most extraordinary gesture of somehow of uh, Rocky Mountain Blue Jays uh, around. They, they arrived seasonally. They arrived several weeks ago. And that, uh, that kind of rack rack you just heard uh, are the Jays. And you, you will see them. They're quite beautiful. Uh, like, like many Jays, they're predominantly blue-gray and um, have that wonderful kind of a spiny crown. And even the females, um, although they're a paler version of the male, which is of course often the case, they're still beautifully uh, a kind of a milky blue, blue beige. So I do hope you see them uh, during during your time here. Well, yes, I always return to the Midwest because that was home. Uh, this dog is uh, Sage, and Sage's mother Corey. is Cory, uh, right there. And Sage oh, okay. has only recently been rescued uh, from um, some kind of uh, uh, trauma, and has come into uh, Cory's life only about three weeks ago. And he's uh, just overwhelmed with gratitude. <laughs> uh -oh. And he is thoroughly expressing it in the most wonderful way. He doesn't, he just right now has died and gone to heaven. Uh, so he's going to have um, uh, 11 women to, uh, wow. to, uh, to receive uh, his affection for the next four days. Yeah. Well, before we um, do our little opening ritual, I just, uh, now that we're all here, um, I would have just like it. It's been just a few minutes uh, being with each other now in this uh, ritual way. So let's just gather ourselves for a moment. Put your butt all the way back into your chair. Put on the ground. Put your hands however you want your hands to be. And I want you to please feel yourself in the lap of the Divine Mother. Pressed into her very being. Your feet on her earth. Your hands filled with your hands as tools, as instruments of praise to her and to welcome each other. Each of you, in however way it happened, 
made your decision to be here. You might have been thinking about it for years, however way, whatever your story is, it's a unique story, but it's brought us here to this moment. And it's a mysterious story. So we begin with the mystery of your stories from the beginning. You had to make many plans, there were many considerations, arrangements. You had to sort through all sorts of practicalities to even bring yourselves here. And I want you to know how, how aware of this I am. Because I accept it as a response, your response to me, and the fact that you all have known me for at least some amount of time through my books. Some of you, indeed, have known me from various workshops that I've done for many years. But at some point, you got beyond the music. Should I do this? Can I do it? Is it time to do it? Maybe next year would be better. All of that, all of that stuff fell away and uh, you made your decision. That moment of decision, all of those first steps were steps moving toward a threshold. When you made your decision, you made a step across the threshold of commitment. And each of you, one by one, have walked through that gate into the threshold of this experience of our four days, the four days we will spend together, <coughs> of our intimate time together, of our intimate getting to know each other, the intimacy of our sisterhood for these days apart. You have all come away in your trust of me and your trust of the unknown, knowing you were going to be with this group of women. Some of you obviously come knowing each other, and that's just wonderful. And the intimacy of our time together is itself the, the freedom each of us will have to be utterly open to this communal experience. Utterly open with great love to each other utterly open to receive the images that I have chosen to show you, utterly open to the themes we will move through each, each day, a different set of themes, and utterly open in our, uh, even, even in the afternoon when we're working separately, open when in fact we meet at the end of every afternoon toward the end of every afternoon to talk about our creative work. We will be praying together and laughing together and laughing together and praying together. And we will be telling a lot of stories. And we will make of these four days something unique. It can only be something unique as we will all be bringing the, 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 very, the very structure of our intimate time together, will call forth stories that you will need to tell each other. I want, uh, practically speaking, just to say a little bit about Air to House. When I began this work in 1995, um, Two women had moved into the front property, which was a great blessing in my life because uh, the people who lived there um, were openly hostile to me. And, uh, although they had sold me the land when they realized that I was a different kind of person, and the hostilities began. Um, and the man who lived here was even worse than the, the couple in the front. So when the folks in the front uh, decided to move on, uh, two women, whom I did not know well, but certainly uh, 
knew to be wonderful people, uh, bought the property. And I would say several years later, this man uh, finally uh, left. And one of the women, Connie Adler and I, one of the women in the front house, bought Air the House together. This was a little ruin of a place. It was, in fact, no more than this little, it was kind of just like this old uh, garage, um, but a little bit bigger. And we completely gutted it and rebuilt it uh, with the understanding that I would begin to have a, I would then have a place for these small groups to happen. And she, who had just was at the process at that point of just finishing her work at Pacifica in Santa Barbara, California, and uh, wanted to, was training to be a counselor. It took us really about a year, because we did most of the work ourselves, um, to rebuild this little house. And of course, you probably know that it's named, uh, Erda House is the house, uh, Erda means um, of the earth. Uh, and of course, is one of the names of, for the Great Mother in um, in German, Germanic literature, Germanic mythology. And so the work began. Began for me in 1995. Uh, we finished her area first, so she could begin first. That was in 1994. And uh, probably about three, three or four years ago she decided that no, she didn't want to be a counselor after all, and um, she wanted out of our arrangement, which threw my life into chaos because there was no way that I could afford to make the, the, total, the totality of the house payments. I mean, I guess I'm still paying in my house kind of thing. So for about six months, um, I was in a state of um, uh, some turmoil because it had been clear to me, um, and I'll, 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 I'll say this, uh, at the time I had begun working with a Nicaraguan shaman who has become a very close friend of mine over the years. And in one of uh, the journeys, when, when he came, came back from the journey, or when we came back from the journey, he, he, his face was, uh, very disturbed, and I just waited for him to say what he needed to say. And he said, uh, Meinrad, it's, uh, he still knew very little English at the time, how uh, uh, it's so clear to me that uh, you are fleeing from your role as priestess. And I was a bit taken aback, not knowing what he meant, also because priestess isn't a word that I use. Um, I think I use the word servant rather than priest because of our associations of priest and priestess involves a sort of hierarchy of authority which I, I don't believe in. Um, but he sort of read me a sort of little riot act. Um, I have seen clearly that you, you must accept this role, that you must begin to be priestesses, so on and so forth. I said, well, mine, well, first of all, uh, <laughs> priestesses need temples. I haven't got a temple. <laughs> and um, over the years, so many people have asked if they can come to work in my studio, and I've just said flat out, no, there's no way I, I can work. I, have, I mean, I invite people into my studio on a regular basis, but not in terms of, of a working uh, situation. And it was... Um, just a few months later that, in fact, um, the man who lived here moved, and Connie and I moved to take possession of the property. And it was all so rapid fire after that that, um, in fact, what Manuel had said all came true, so to speak. Before I um, begin um, the... Um, the blessing. I want to just uh, return now to a moment of silence. Again, uh, meditating together in this place of, um, in this sacred circle, in her lap with our feet on the ground. 
And let's begin now, just a few minutes of this, um, of this silence together. we stand before you worshipfully to begin this first day of being together. We bless you for our safe journeys. We bless you for our individual stories which you have called us here together to hear from each other. We bless your presence among us in every way. We bless the presence of Dira. Sage, I was going to say Adam, uh, the last um, uh, pooch like this I knew was Adam. Uh, I buried, helped bury Adam about a year and a half ago. In fact, one of the paintings I'll show you is, uh, is about Adam. We bless the presence of, um, of our, this dear animal friend. We bless our own animal energies. We bless the fierce animal energies in our souls and our, the work of our imaginations. We bless divine Artemis, the mother of all creatures, in our presence. Blessed be our gathering at this very, very beautifully, profoundly important turning of the year, as we leave behind the fullness, the, the miracle of seeds planted which have now grown to maturity, have now been harvested, the seeds kept over to be planted for the next season. Blessed be divine Persephone who has done her work, the daughter who has done her work most beautifully, most harmoniously, most obediently to the divine forces. She has walked the earth, spreading her bounty, spreading her fruitfulness, it is now time for her to move down into the level of darkness, the abiding darkness, the great container of darkness which supports the bounty of the earth. We enter into this period of mourning with her Divine Mother Demeter. And move through these six months in the deepest touch with the daughter's energies below and the mother's energies above as the keeper of the earth, as the keeper of the secrets of the earth in its passive waiting period. Blessed be Demeter's divine fires on the earth Persephone's divine fires in her sacred marriage with Hades in the bowels of the earth. Blessed be this holy rhythm. Blessed be this full moon which we're approaching, the hugest moon that we know, which will be um, on Saturday or Sunday, and Sunday, and of course into Monday too. We bless you for this mystery of mother and daughter, which of course we have all participated in, in our own divine stories. In the Catholic Church, September 15th 
which of course was just a few days ago, is the Feast of the Sorrowing Mother. And of course, like all of the Catholic rituals, has come out of all of the mythologies and rituals for millennia from the ancient societies, layer upon layer upon layer of all the societies, which we understand as the core of the beginnings of Western society and the great fertile basin of the Mediterranean, which many of us, if not most of us, have come from. Blessed be this, this holy fountain of our origin, and blessed be these mysteries, and blessed be this mystery of the Mater Dolorosa, um, a hugely important presence in the land you are in now, the land of New Mexico, the land of, uh, of the Hispanic culture since the 17th century. The mother who grieves, as Demeter has grieved for millennia, so the mother in Christianity takes over her role as the mother who grieves the loss of the divine son. The son who must die, the seed who must die in order for grain to rise so that we may eat the body of the God through time and drink the blood of the God through time. So that the these ancient beginnings in Christianity, which are perhaps most elaborately still celebrated within the Catholic tradition, um, even if you don't, uh, don't in any way subscribe to this theologically, at least historically, you can honor the ancient tradition still within the Catholic Church. this land. And I'm going to give you two blessings uh, with their bodies. The first story is um, the story of Old Salt Woman. Zuni Pueblo is um, a distinct Pueblo. Most of the Pueblos are lined up along the Rio Grande from north to south. The northernmost in New Mexico is Taos, and the southernmost um, is south of Albuquerque um, in a little village called um, Berlin. And our nearest one uh, here in Albuquerque is Sandia. These are the Sandia Mountains, and the Pueblo is, uh, is just at the base of the Sandia Mountains. Zuni is a Pueblo. Pueblo is the Spanish word simply meaning city. Uh, it's outside the system and has, therefore, its own unique character. It is the first, historically, the first Pueblo uh, which the conquistadores of the 1600s 
uh, came to when they um, set out north from Mexico City to explore um, this area that we, we now live in. And one of the old, oldest stories from Zuni Pueblo is about old salt woman. And the story, like many of these stories, is begins the same way. In the beginning, there was old salt woman. And she it was who held her people together in community and gave them especially this one essential element, salt. And if you ever have a chance to visit Zuni, you will see the great natural salt plain, which is part of the landscape, and from which they still collect. This is rock salt from Zuni. And the peoples lived in harmony with her for millennia. And at a certain point, for whatever reason, the peoples began to pull away from her, or not pull away so much as simply not remember her, and then really not remember until finally she became just a spirit that had been there among them at some point. But as this diminution uh, happened, uh, they began to find less and less salt, less and less salt. And at a certain point, of course, it became critical because, as we know, we cannot live with salt, nor animals, no animal can live without salt. So the holy men, of course, had noticed this happening. And finally, uh, in, in the, when the community had reached crisis, um, pulled the community together and said, look, this is, she has, she's vanishing. She's vanishing. We must she must come back, we must call her back. And the holy people begged her to return over a period of time and finally had the understanding from her that she would return, but only, she would only return as salt, as this, as this, um, as this stuff that the human, that they as humans needed, that all animals needed. She would only return as, as salt, give them her body, if they agreed to live a life of thanksgiving. And as they took salt into their mouth each morning and let it dissolve on their tongue, that they would, in that act of communion, of taking her body into their bodies, that they would each morning reenact their commitment and their, indeed, their very life support system with this great mother. So I'm going to go around now and give each of you a piece of her body. And I would like for you to hold out your left hand, supported by your right hand, and receive it. And if you could wait until I've given the, the this rock salt to each of you, and then we will take communion at the same time.
from others, especially among the Zuni and the Hopi people. Now, the Hopi people are quite a separate people. They do not, they've never been part of the Pueblo system. But they, of course, are uh, ancient, ancient people in this land. They live in the uh, eastern edge of Arizona. And among the Native American peoples in this area of the Southwest are the peoples most in touch uh, with their most ancient roots and have um, a much more elaborate ritual system moving, of course, through the, the year of the, the phases of the sun. They don't live, they are not a Pueblo people, they don't live in a single community. They live in the same area, in different mesas, as, as the areas are called, the way the, the formation of the land uh, has, has, has given itself to them. But all of the Pueblo people uh, honor Crow Mother as the mother who brings us food, the sacred cornmeal, yellow, red, white, and blue cornmeal, blue being the most sacred of the four, the sacred squash, the sacred beans, and sacred tobacco, which of course is used only ritually. She is the, although blue corn represents her body. In fact, she is not corn mother. Corn mother is an entirely different spirit in the Kachina world. Kachina, the, the word Kachina simply means uh, uh, the uh, spirits who bless from the mountains. They are mountain spirits. They live for six months of the year in the mountains, in the four sacred mountains in this area, and for half of the year in the Pueblos with people. Some of the most powerful dances um, are the going home dances when the Pachinos go home in the mountains and when they return to the peoples six months later, coming, the going home, the coming home dances. So although she is Crow Mother, the great mother of the great above and the great below, as any bird is a spirit of the above, but also a spirit of the ground. She walks the earth. She lives in the heavens. She it is who makes sure that we have the food that we need, our bodies need, and the food that our spirits need. She sometimes referred, referred to as the mother of all Kachinas, and in this sense, probably is uh, like our understanding of the ancient great mother, the ancient great goddess. It is her enigmatic black face, the enigmatic blackness of her presence, uh, which also associates her with some of the Chthonic goddesses that we know in our own Western mythologies, so that I myself, from the beginning of my, I, I first came to New Mexico in 19, um, let's see, when was that, 1960, 1960 it would have been. And so I've known about Crow Mother for a long, long time, and she has been, central to my prayer since then. And even for the long period when I lived abroad for over 20 years, she was still very much a part of my prayer life. And possibly because it was in Europe that I began to have a connection with the Black Madonnas, that in my own, my own spirituality, they, they are the same energy. So that although I worship her here,
calling her Crow Mother, she is also the Dark Mother that I have worshipped um, all of my life. And this will, I will be able to show you images of this, I think, um, I think on Saturday. We'll be looking at images of her and uh, the Black Madonnas of Europe. So, again, I'm going to go around, and if you can hold out your left hand, I'm going to give you this food and ask you to communicate with her, take her body into your body. And if you can wait until I've distributed the uh, blue corn meal, uh, then we can take communion together. to be this communion together. It's just a joy to have him here. Uh, I just, I, I, I'm almost, I, it's like I'm glad you, you didn't tell me in advance. I, I'm filled with the surprise of his being here. And I hope, I'm, I'm sure you are for us. Thanks you for this gift. <laughs> 